today we're going to do another topical teaching and I usually do this after every book that I finish. Uh, do a couple of, uh, of topical messages before we dive into another book, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And today's message was also uh, very near to me, very dear to me, because um, there was a time when I was confused about my identity and who I was, who I truly was. And maybe some of you have struggled with that as well. Well, I hope today's message, again, will help you and will guide you. And so I titled today's message, Identifying Your Identity. Identifying Your Identity. Let me begin by sharing this story first. While walking through the forest one day, a man, a man found a young eagle who had fallen out of his nest. He took it home, put it in his barnyard where it took some uh, learned, it, it soon learned to eat and behave like the chickens. One day, a naturalist passed by the farm and asked why it was that, why was that king of all birds should be confined to live in the barnyard with the chickens? The farmer replied that since he had given it chicken feed and trained it to be a chicken, it never, had never really learned to fly. Since it now behaved as the other chickens, it was no longer an eagle. Still, it has the heart of an eagle, replied the naturalist, and can surely be taught to fly. He lifted the eagle toward the sky and said, You belong to the sky and not the earth. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, however, was confused. He did not know who he was. And seeing the chickens eating their food, he jumped down to be with them again. The naturalist took the bird to the roof of the house and urged him again, saying, You are an eagle. Stretch forth your wings and fly. But the eagle was afraid of his unknown self and, and world and jumped down once more for the chicken food. Finally, the naturalist took the eagle out of the barnyard to a high mountain. There he held, he held the king of all birds high above him and encouraged him, saying, You are an eagle. You belong to the sky. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle looked around, back towards the barnyard and up the sky. Then the naturalist lifted him straight towards the sun, and it happened that the eagle began to tremble. Stro slowly, he stretched his wings and with a triumphant cry, soared away into the heavens. Now, it may be that the eagle still remembers the chickens with nostalgia. It may even be that he occasionally revisits the barnyard. But as far as anyone knows, he never returned to lead the life of a chicken. This illustration I just shared with you all is an example of a person who was made and created to be an eagle, yet because of his or her circumstances, they've come to believe that they're a chicken. Someone once said, the e e e egoic state, your sense of self, your identity, is derived from your thinking mind. In other words, what your mind tells you about yourself, the storyline of you, the memories, the expectations, all the thoughts that go through your head continuously, and the emotions that reflect the thoughts, all those things make up your sense of self. So, if how we see ourselves and what we think of ourselves shapes our identity, then it's absolutely important that you identify your identity. Why? Why is it important? Because once you become aware of who you truly are, it has the potential to radically change your life forever soar like the eagle towards the heaven and never look at yourself a 
chicken. Now, this is, again, one of those topics that right now in the day and age that we're living right now in our culture, a lot of talk about identity. And there's people here, people there that identify as this, identify as that, and they stay in that box. And it's sad to me. And it's sad when there's Christians, believers, doing that as well. Now, today we're going to be going through several passages, various passages in our Bible. I will try to go slowly if you want to turn there in, in your Bibles. The first one, actually, I am going to ask you to turn. It's going to be in, a, in the book of Daniel. But my hope this morning, whether you're here or watching this or hearing this later on, is that God would reveal to you through His Word and His Spirit your true identity so that you may live as you ought to. Today's message will show you you aren't what's been done to you, but what Jesus has already done for you. You aren't what you do, but what Jesus has already done. What you do doesn't determine who you are, your past mistakes, your sins from the past, your sins that you've committed now, your sins from the future, they don't determine you. They don't define you. Rather, who you are in Christ determines what you do, who you are, what you'll become. So, before we begin exploring these fundamental truths, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, I am thankful that you have us all here, Lord. And what a wonderful time of worship that, you've, that, we've, that we had, Lord. And I pray that it truly was beautiful and a beautiful sound unto your ears, Lord. I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to be up here and to share your word, Lord. I pray you will bless it, that it will go forth powerfully, Lord, that it will change lives, change relationships, that more people will come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. I pray that it will also help people to understand and realize who they truly are. That the identities that people have in this world, in this life, are just labels, they're nothing, Lord. May they see, Lord, understand where their true identity lies or where can, they can have a true identity. So I pray you will bless again this message Keep us safe here, Lord. Fill this room with your spirit. And now we, may we have eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, what you have to say. Pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, as I said, we're just going to start off with in Daniel right now, the Old Testament book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to begin in verse 28. The Word of God says, All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, the king exclaimed, Is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power? and for my majestic glories, glory. While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it's been declared that the kingdom has departed from you. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals, and you will feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time. 
until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over a human kingdom and he gives them to anyone he wants. At that moment, the message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew to be eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Like King Nebuchadnezzar that we just read about, many people often find their identity in who they are, what they own, and what they've done. I want to begin right now by looking at some common ways people often identify themselves and the dangers that may occur in allowing them to define you. Achievements and duties. Here are the four, four most common areas that uh, people often identify in, in their education, in their careers, in their ministry, and hobbies. The problem that comes with allowing these four areas to become your identity is that you'll always be searching for something to excel in in an effort to outperform others and to demonstrate your superiority. Once you find that thing, that thing that I, you feel that, you, that identifies you, it will often lead to overcommitment and an obsession with mastering it. And what often results from that is that other people and things begin to matter little because you've began, you began to place yourself on the altar of success to the God of achievement. Winning or becoming the best is all that matters. Ach climbing up that ladder, getting to the top rung of that ladder of success, it's all that matters. And the more that happens, the less compassion you begin to have for others. The easier it gets just to step on others to get onto the next rung. Not only will this cause disdain for others, but what happens often, usually, is that you'll also find yourself hurting, struggling, and failing because your focus is solely on boasting about yourself and your achievements. So when you fail or lose, depression, panic, and devastation will overtake you. And again, it'll make you both miserable and miserable to be around. See, my friends, the truth is, is that your identity isn't found in that degree you have from that prestigious university isn't found in achieving that spot in whatever job you're in. It's not found in, in ministry either or your hobbies. As a Christian, it's important that you recognize that you have God-given natural talents, spiritually gifted by the Holy Spirit, you are spiritually gifted by the Holy Spirit, and that you have unique abilities. With all these combined, you have the potential to be greater than any of those, in any of those, greater than any of those four areas, and can do so much more for the glory of God. Now, once you understand that your identity is in Christ alone, it's important from there to begin to realign your priorities. Priorities. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, in the New Living Translation, says this, For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. See, when you know that you know what really matters in life, your priorities will begin to change dramatically. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus identified what those top two. Now, there are many priorities as Christians, but in, the, in that verse I just mentioned, he identifies the top two. And that's, this is what he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So when you begin to make these two your top priorities, it will enable you, it will enable you to gain focus. It makes life easier, and it will free you up to do what God wants you to do. Now again, another thing that peace, people will falsely find their identity in is in their possessions. Common examples are money, cars, technology, houses. But here's the thing. What we own is our public way of projecting what we want others to believe about us. And for some people, it defines who they are. So when we're not keeping up with the Joneses, it somehow devalues us as human beings. Friends, again, when consumerism is your religion and your possessions are the object of your worship, the things you own, begin to own you. In Luke chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus said, For what your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing up here and saying that it's sinful to buy things or even appreciate them and enjoy them. However, when those things become the source of your identity, we become guilty of idolatry. Also, in Luke's gospel, we're given an example of someone who had the opportunity to gain everything if he just surrendered the source of his identity. Let me read that to you. It's in Luke chapter 18. I'm going to go there. In Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 23, a rich young ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. I have kept all these from my youth, he said. When Jesus heard this, he told him, You still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. This rich young ruler could have had eternal life right there. If he just simply followed Jesus. He could have had the wisdom that, man, that you can write volumes and volumes about the wisdom of God himself. He could have heard it, but no. What he had was more important to him. Is that you? Are you willing to give up what really matters what really 
is the source of true life, true identity for those temporary things, for the here and now, for the things, again, that you won't even be able to take with you when you die. Again, do those things own you? Do you own them or do they own you? Now, the third place people will try to find their identity in is in a collective tribe of people. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by collective tribal people, a tribe? It's basically a greater community with which people most closely identify with. This, again, would include having uh, those, those having the same race, culture, income level, political party, theological beliefs, and religious practices. Now, it's true that God made us for friendship and community. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's good to have others in our lives. However, like all things, this good thing can become a bad thing if those tribes become the source of your identity. This happens broadly in our identification with a collective tribe of people and narrowly in our individual relationship with others. Like I said, while it's good to have a community, we often turn this good thing into a bad thing by basing our identity, by basing our identity on and idolizing our tribes. You see, this happens. You see, that happens. Other tribes, when that happens, other tribes are demonized. And when that happens, there is often unnecessary hostility with those who aren't part of your community. As believers, although we're all different in one way or another, we're all united together by the blood of Christ. And as a result, God sees us as equal. God sees us the same. We're all made in His image. We're all His children. There's no one greater than one another. There's no one group. The blacks aren't better than us. The whites aren't better than us. The Mexicans aren't. No, we're all one people. The rich people aren't better than us. The poor people. The marginalized. Oh, no, God sees us all the same. Therefore, we ought to see each other as He sees us. And we should avoid making, you know, this church or any church or any church that you belong to a closed off community of people where you begin to say, hey, you know what? Yeah, no, those people, they're not allowed. They're not part of our tribe, so they're not allowed to be in here. Definitely don't want that happening here in this church. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And let me also just mention this. Again, while I'm leading this church, all will be welcomed here, regardless of what collective tribe of people they identify themselves in or with. And I believe in time, 
that when they surrender those tribal identities, just like many of you have, God will reveal to them the greater tribe that they're, now, that they're now a part of, a greater kingdom. So now that I've mentioned some of the common ways people tend to mistakenly identify themselves at, as, I want to mention some ways now that the devil tries to lie to us about our identity. Now there are many again, but I just chose three here. I'm not saying these are the only ones. But I just, again, I just chose three here. The first lie he'll tell you is that you're not good enough. A devil will tell you that being good is just good enough. When the reality is that Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. Therefore, when it comes down to it, you need to realize and understand that without God's forgiveness, we're all guilty. We're all guilty sinners, filthy sinners in His eyes. You may do a lot of great things. You may do a lot of things in your community. You may do a lot of great things in your church. You may help out here and there and But here's the thing, on a scale of God's holy, righteous standards, a person's sins will always outweigh their good deeds. However, a few verses after Romans chapter 3, verse 10, and verses 23 and 20 through 26, Paul says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they speaking of those who trust in Christ, are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as an atoning sacrifice in His blood, received through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. Because of His restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented Him to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so that He would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. Another lie from the devil that is that you're unaccountable. That you're unaccountable. You're not accountable to anyone at all. Maybe even you're, you're only accountable to yourself. You see, the devil will deceive you by telling you that you are the master of your destiny. When the reality is, Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says this, each of us, every single one will give an account of himself to God. If then you're going to be held accountable for every word and deed you ever did, While you were alive, how will God judge you? When you stand before Him, how will He judge you? Every word and deed that you said and done, will He judge you innocent or guilty? Let me tell you this, folks. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that your sins may be forgiven, and so that you can stand justified before God, so you can stand before Him innocent, clean, white as snow. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me repeat that verse. He made the one who did not know sin to be the sin for us, to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, don't believe the lies of the devil. 
because that's who he is. That's all he does. All he wants to do is to kill and destroy as many people as he can. And he knows his time is limited. And so he wants to take down as many people as possible. Don't fall for it. All he wants to do is kill and destroy. Yes, you may have the freedom to choose how you live your life, but God ultimately will hold you accountable for that freedom that he's given you. Remember that. A third lie from the devil is that you're unredeemable. This lie keeps people from discovering their true identity. And that is that God, uh, the, the it, it keeps them from discovering their, their true identity. And it makes them think that God would never accept love and forgive them. Neil T. Anderson wrote this. The major strategy of Satan is to distort the character of God and the truth of who we are. He can't change God, and he can't do anything to change our identity and position in Christ. If, however, he can get us to believe a lie, we will live as though our identity in Christ isn't true. In John 5, verse 24, Jesus said this, Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. And in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 through 22, we're told, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, speaking of Jesus, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. No matter how bad, my friends, those of you watching and listening to this, no matter how bad you think that you've blown it, how far you think that you've walked away or how down you think you've fallen away while you're still alive, while you're still breathing, while you still have a conscious mind, you're not beyond redemption. God can and will forgive you or how bad again it is, or what you think you've done. Cheated on your wife? Have you cheated on your husband? He will forgive you. Or even if you're not a believer, and you feel horrible for what you've done, for getting caught, whatever it may be, God will forgive you. If you've murdered somebody, God will forgive you. The most horrible sins that you can imagine... God will forgive you. There will be consequences. There may be consequences for those sins, for those actions that you may have to deal with. But still, even a life in prison is nothing compared to the eternal glory that awaits you. Eternal. Forever. Minute. This life is minute compared to eternity. Do you have that perspective? Do you have that mindset? Because when you do, again, nothing this world throws at you. No position you're in. 
will it matter because you know that you're going to be spending eternity in heaven in the kingdom of God with Jesus and all his glory and all your glory as well. God can and will forgive you, my friends. I want to spend the next few minutes now telling you where your true identity lies. If you still have your Bibles open, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously lived according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You were saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift. It is God's gift, not from work so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. This story is told, the story is told of artist Paul Gustav Dor, Dore, Dory, who was traveling in Europe when he faced a predicament. He reached a border crossing and discovered that he had misplaced his passport. Without papers, the officer allowed Dory to pass. Finally, Dory was given a test to prove his identity. The official gave him a piece of paper and a pencil and requested he draw a group of nearby peasants. Dory did so with such ease that the official was convinced he was indeed the famed artist. Paul Dory's identity was affirmed through his work. Many people in our world find their identity through their work or accomplishments. As Christians, our identity isn't in what we do, but in who we belong to. We are children of God, heir, heirs to his kingdom. So apart from God, apart from God, as a believer, we have no identity and are but another lost soul in this world. But with God, in Christ, you are a child of the King. We have hope, we have purpose, and what's even greater, what's even, what I think is great is that we have meaning. No matter what fails in your life, if you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, if you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you are a child of God. Outside things can change, your circumstances can change. You can live in the other side of the world where the culture is completely different. But the one thing that is sure, one thing that is certain, one thing that's a fact and that will never change, never change and that is that you'll always be one of God's own. Now, who does God say that we are reading this passage? The Bible tells us that now, I'm speaking here generally to those who, uh, to just mankind in, in, in general. Who does God say, say uh, we are? The Bible tells us that you are made in God's image. Genesis 126. 
And God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. Some may ask, did man's fall into sin destroy or remove that imago Deo, that image of God? Well, no, it merely marred or disfigured it. This is the crucial distinction since it's the image of God that makes us different than the rest of creation. If you want to know what makes us distinct, what makes us different than the animals of this world, the trees, all other life on, here on earth, is that we as human beings are made in the image of God. As theologian Louis Burkhoff puts it, the doctrine of the image of God in man is the greatest importance in theology, for that image is the expression of that which is most distinctive in man and his relation to God. The fact that man is the image is the image of God distinguishes him from all the animal and every other creature. To put it another way, it's precisely the image of God that makes man human. Man could not lose the image without ceasing to be what he is. Furthermore, it's only because he retains it, even in a broken or distorted, distorted form, that man is redeemable and worth redeeming. And so without it, God would have no reason or motivation to send his son to die on our behalf. Friends, this is a vital point, not only strictly from a theological point of view, but also in connection with practical issues such as the sanctity of human life. Every single child, every single baby that's in a mother's womb is made in the image of God. God's word also says that you're unique. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonder wondrously made. Your works are wondrous and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days are written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. You are unique. Even though we're all his children, you're special. You are special uniquely special in his eyes. He knew you before time began. He will know you in eternity if you accept Jesus. But he knew who you were and, and he knows your good parts, your bad parts. He loves you. He always has and always will must believe in him. You must believe in Jesus. And third, Scripture tells us that humanity is loved. You are loved. Famous verse that many of you already know and have memorized, John 3.16, For God loved the world not just certain groups of people, but love the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This was a gift to the entire world, not just to a select group of people. Since it's God's essential nature to love, to love, he demonstrates his love by lavishing it on undeserving people 
who are in rebellion against him. So you see, God's love isn't a sappy, sentimental, romantic feeling kind of love. No, it's not. It's an agape love. A love of self-sacrifice. He demonstrates this sacrificial love by sending his son to the cross to pay the penalty of our sin by drawing us to himself, by forgiving us our rebellion against him, and by sending his Holy Spirit to dwell within us, thereby enabling us to love as he loves. He did this. God did this in spite of the fact that we didn't deserve it. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is personal, my friends. He knows each of one of us individual and loves us personally. His, his is a mighty love that has no beginning and no end. It's with it's this ex, uh, it is this, it's experiencing God's love that distinguishes Christianity from other religions. Why does God love us? It's because who, it's who He is. And this is where that expression comes in. God is love. That was generally for humanity, but if you're a believer, if you're a Christian sitting here today, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is what the Bible says. This is what our passage says, that you now are, who your, your identity. In Christ, you are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. The word therefore refers us back to verses 14 and 16, where Paul tells us that all believers have died with Christ and no longer live for themselves. Our lives as Christians are no longer worldly. They are now spiritual. Our death is that of the old sin nature which was nailed to the cross with Christ. It was buried with Him. And just as He was raised up by the Father, so are we raised up to walk in the newness of life. That new person, my friends, that was raised up is what Paul refers to in 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 17, as the new creation. You, as a born-again believer, are a new creation. That old person, that sinful person that you were before receiving Christ, that person is dead. You are a new creation in God's eyes. Number two, in Christ, as a believer, you are saved. Romans 5, 6 through 11 for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely someone die for a just person, though for a good person. Perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that we were, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more than since we have been declared righteous by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if, while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? And not only that, but we also rejoice through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. So if you're asking, what are we saved from? In the Christian doctrine of salvation, we are saved from wrath. That is, the, that is God's judgment of sin. Our sin separated, ourselves, separated us from God. 
and the consequence of sin is death. Salvation, therefore, refers to our deliverance from the consequences of sin and therefore involves the removal of sin. And since you are saved, Christian, since you are saved, you can't be unsaved. Let me repeat that. Since you are saved, you can't be unsaved. Your salvation cannot be lost, but the rewards and blessings God has in store for you can be forfeited by you. What about the Christian who continues to sin? Is there a difference between continuing to sin and continuing? Well, there is a difference between continuing to sin and continuing to live in sin. No one on this side of heaven can reach sinless perfection. But the redeemed Christian is being sanctified, being made holy day by day, sinning less and hating it more each time he fails. Yes, as Christians, we still sin. We're still going to sin. We're human. I'm human. I'm still going to fail. I'm still going to sin. The difference is that the new creation as a new creation, you're no longer a slave to sin as you formerly were. You are now freed from sin, and it no longer has power over you. Now we are empowered by and for righteousness. We now have the choice to let sin reign or to count ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Best of all, now we have power, we have the power to choose the latter. And thirdly, you are heirs. As Christians, as believers, you are heirs. Galatians 3, 26 through 29, for, though, for through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. And so to be in Christ means you have accepted his sacrifice as payment for your own sin. The truth is, Our rap sheets, I've seen many rap sheets, but our own personal rap sheets contain every single sinful thought, attitude, or action you have ever committed. Nothing is hidden from God. No amount of self-cleansing can make you pure through the warrant, uh, to warrant forgiveness. And to have a relationship with the Holy God. The Bible tells us that on our behalf, the Bible tells us that our natural sinful, in our natural sinful state, we are enemies of God. But when we accept the sacrifice, His sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, He switches accounts with us. He exchanges our list of sins for Jesus' perfect account that is totally pleasing to God. Jesus, the perfect person that ever lived, never committed a sin. Now we switch places. There at the cross, He took our sin and we receive Him. We receive his righteousness. He exchanges our list of sins for his perfect account. Again, that is totally pleasing to God. A divine exchange takes place there at the foot of the cross. Our old sin nature for his perfect one. (coughs) So again, just to recap quickly what I covered today. Your identity. Your identity as a person, as a human being, as a Christian. 
fake, false identities, things that you're not. Your identity isn't in your achievement and your duties. Your identity isn't in your possessions. Your identity isn't in a collective tribe of people. Here are the lies from the devil. You are not good enough. That you're unaccountable to no one but yourself. And you're unredeemable. Your true identity now. In general, God says that we're all made in God's image. We're unique. And that we're loved. And as a believer, as a believer, if you're born again Christian, you are a new creation. You are saved. And you are heirs with Christ. So now, let me ask you, as I close here, as I finish, have you identified your identity? I'm not talking about your sexual identity. I'm not talking about your gender identity. I'm not talking about your social class. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about your eternal identity. At this very moment, right now, you have a decision to make. You can either re receive the free forgiveness that God offers you through Jesus Christ, become identified with Him or in Him, or you can say no. That's what free will is. But just know this. You may, have, you may not have another opportunity again. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. If you're ready to receive forgiveness, if you're ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, ready to be saved, be forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future, I want to invite you to the cross and bear your heart to Jesus. With all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I'll turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. I know you prayed that. I want to help you in your next steps if you need some help finding a church or what to do next. Um, I want to help you with that. Thank you for checking us out. Um, Pray this, again, this message blessed you. Please share it out there to anyone who uh, you think may hear it, like it. So I um, hope you have a great week. Be, be blessed. Uh, be safe. Bless others. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.